it again. I'm going to read Matthew <laughs> chapter 6, verse 1 uh, from the New English translation, and then we'll skip down to verse 5 and, all the, and read all the way through to 15. I'll read that one in my normal New King James. So the Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 1, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. And then down to verse 5, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your word. And I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the word of God today. Lord, speak to us. Help us hear you so that we may change our lives and live in the blessing that you've appointed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever prayed for something without seeing the answer come? And then, you know, maybe you're talking to a, another brother and sister at church or maybe you're at work and they prayed for the same thing and they got it. And you'd be like, why? why? I prayed, we just prayed for the same prayer. Why did you get your prayer answered and why didn't I get my prayer answered? Have, has anybody had that experience or just me? Okay, I do see some, uh, yes, thank you, amen. Because I'm, I'm just thinking, wait a second now. If it's just me, that's a problem. But it's not just me because I see it in the Bible. Y'all remember the story of the man who uh, came to Jesus' disciples? Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain to pray, to be with the Father, and left the rest of the disciples down at the bottom of the mountain. And uh, at that point, some guy brings his son up who was struggling with uh, demonic oppression and a epileptic spirit that would just make him have convulsions and throw him on the ground and sometimes try to throw him in the fire or throw him in the water to drown him. And the dad was pouring out his life, protecting this kid, trying to take care of this kid, trying to be, be you know, be a dad, provide, take, but his whole life was focused on his kids. So he hears about Jesus doing miracles. He hears about the disciples praying for the sick. So he brings his son. Now the disciples start praying and they're trying to pray for this boy. They're trying to pray for his healing. And they're trying to pray for his deliverance and nothing happens. And while they're praying, a big crowd of people comes around right? And everybody's watching them like, oh, you're the disciples of Jesus. This is going to be awesome, except for it's not awesome because the more they pray, the less happens. And then of course, Jesus comes down and he's glowing, right? Because he had this transforming experience on the mountain. Y'all remember that God showed up and spoke and Peter lost his mind is like, hey, Moses and Elijah are here and let's set up tents and let's hear everybody. And then they come down the mountain. Jesus sees the man. He sees the crowds. He sees the boy. And he rolls up and says, what's going on? They tell him the story. Jesus prays. Instantly, the boy is healed. Instantly. Like, all of a sudden, it's good. And the disciples are, they're, they're, you know, they're like, of course, Jesus is going to pray and it's going to work. But then they came to the Lord and they said, Lord, how is it that we prayed the words you prayed? We prayed the prayer you prayed. We, we did what you taught us to do. And we didn't get the results that you got. Y'all remember Jesus' answer, right? This doesn't come out by what? prayer with fasting. So here's the thing. They had part of the process right, but they were missing something for it to work. Their prayer was partially right, but it wasn't completely right. And as a result, they didn't receive the reward of their faith. Throughout Jesus's public life and ministry, he modeled and taught on effective prayer. There are a lot of, of scriptures that teach what Jesus did when he did. Matter of fact, the book of Luke is often called uh, Jesus's prayer journal because you can see every major decision, every pivotal moment, Jesus went away to pray. 
over and over and over again, he went away to pray. And Luke chronicles that. In the Sermon on the Mount, he offers us insight so that we can pray as effectively as he did. Would anybody like to be able to pray as effective as Jesus? Yes. Come on, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yes. As with giving, like we talked about last week, Jesus assumes that his followers would be people of prayer, right? What does he say? Not if you pray. He says, when you pray. I'm gonna read you a quote from Matthew Henry, who, by the way, has one of my favorite commentaries. So if you ever wanna just get a good commentary, Matthew Henry's commentary is a, a legit one. He said, this is what he says. It is taken for granted that all who are disciples of Christ pray. You may as soon find a living man that does not breathe as a living Christian that does not pray. If prayerless, then graceless. He said, you may find a, a, a living person that doesn't breathe, which is that gonna happen? No. He said, if you can find a living person that doesn't breathe, you can find a Christian that doesn't pray. If prayerless, then graceless. Listen, we know that for Christians, prayer is not an optional practice. It's a necessary one. We have to pray. And we also know that not all prayer is considered equal, is it? So we have to learn how to pray the right way if we want an answer to our prayers. Learning to follow Jesus' example and apply his teaching on prayer will enable us to receive the heavenly reward for praying. Remember, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is not opposed to reward. The scripture often talks about the reward of faith. And the reward of prayer is just the answer. It's the response. And Jesus indicated that when we pray in a way that pleases the Father, then we receive the reward that we're desiring. To put it simple, if we pray like Jesus, we'll get results like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Have y'all heard the story about the, the lady with the pot roast? I heard this years ago, and, I, and, and uh, while I was studying, the Lord reminded me of this. There was a lady that uh, she had a party over, and she made this pot roast was awesome. And so her friend said, hey, can I get the recipe? And she's like, sure, it's a family recipe. I'll hook you up, and she gives her the recipe. Uh, the friend, you know, a week later says, hey, I got a question about this recipe. And she's like, okay, what is it? She said, well, why does the recipe call for you to cut off both ends of the pot roast? Like, what good does that do? Does that make it better? Like, why am I cutting off both ends? And she's like, you know what? I don't even know. I've just been following the recipe. So she calls mom. She says, hey, mom, you know grandma's recipe with the pot roast? Oh, yeah, I know that one. Like, why do we cut off both ends? And mom's like, I don't know. That's just how we always do it. Let's ask grandma. So finally, the, the girl, the, the woman calls her grandma and says, grandma, you know that recipe for pot roast? She's like, hey, I love that recipe. I was sharing with a friend and they asked a question I couldn't answer. And it was this, why do we cut off the ends of the pot roast? And y'all know what grandma said. She said, well, because the pot roast would never fit in the pan that I had. <laughs> so for two generations, they were cooking pot roast the same. You know, the story of the pot roast helps illustrate some of the problems we have with prayer. We've all adopted different attitudes and different models of prayer based on what was passed down to us, based on what we saw, based on our experience. You know, when you go to a church for the first time, however those people pray, you're probably gonna pray like them because they're your example, right? Y'all know that we have what's called mirror neurons in our brain, right? And that's what causes us to, to mirror the responses of others. So if you ever sit and watch people talk, eventually they'll breathe at the same pace. Eventually they'll blink at the same rate. The more they connect to each other, one person is gonna come in sync with the other one. This is how it is with prayer. This is how it is with doctrine. We come into alignment with the environment of, that we're in, with the teaching, with the people, with the practices we're around. So you might have some habits that are just that, they're habits. For some of us, that means it's, a, it's kind of a, prayer is a very religious and formal thing. I, I, I love, there's a brother of mine that I'm thinking of that, that every time he prays, he gives this deep voice. Oh, Lord, Father God, I can't even do it. But he's got this awesome, deep, very white voice that he just, he don't talk like that normally, but when he prays, it just changes. And when, it, when he prays, the language goes from normal people talk to theolo you know, theologian talk. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like the big words comes out. Oh, consecrate this day. <laughs> he doesn't talk like that normally, but when it comes to prayer, what does he do? He adopts the model that he grew up in. I'm not knocking that, but I'm just saying that's part of what we do. For some of us that, 
that means that prayer is really just good vibes or good thoughts right? You see this on the internet. Anytime someone gets hurt on TV or anytime there's like a, oh, I'm sending good vibes your way or good thoughts your way. Bro, your good vibes and good thoughts ain't helping me. I'm glad you're thinking good vibes and good thoughts, but I want you to pray. Or when people say, I'll say a prayer, guess what? You ain't doing nothing. No, because here's the thing. You either pray or you say something. I don't want words. I want prayer. Amen. But here's the thing, where did that come from? Because it sounds good and we listen to the people around us and that's what they say. Make sense? Yes. Sometimes prayer looks like mantras or, or repeated phrases and over and over and over saying, you know, maybe you grew up Catholic and maybe you said our father 27 times because you lied. Or maybe you had to say Hail Mary full of grace 35 times because you cheated on a test. I don't know. But sometimes your environment has taught you that repetition is what matters. The more you say it, I mean, you could be, you could have grown up Buddhist or you can have grown, grown up Hindu where it's the repetition of those phrases that give you some kind of access to the God or, or God you're trying to get to. Ultimately, these approaches, what they do is they take prayer and make it some kind of magical or mystical incantation and makes it some kind of transactional deal between God and us. It's like, I'm going to do a deal with God. I'm going to barter with God. I'm going to work out God. But prayer really is an expression of faith and trust in God and in his plan and his purpose for us. It's so much more than an obligation. So much better than good thoughts. It's more than spiritual manipulation meant to barter with God for what we want or what we need. Do you know that when they, well, I won't get into that. Listen, how we pray matters if we want to receive the reward of God's answer. answer. Otherwise, we're just, saying words into the air. If we really want to experience the power of prayer, then we need to learn how pray, to pray as Jesus did and follow his model of prayer. And as children of God, and this is what you need to understand, as children of God, you have access to the throne of grace. You know what that means? That means you don't need a person to go between you and God. That means you personally get to come before God, the creator of the universe. He will actually listen to your voice. You are a child of God. You're not a stepkid. You're not a, a, a business partner. You're not an outsider. You have direct access. Amen. Amen? Amen? Now, as pastor, you might be able to ask, ask me for some things and I can give them to you. But my kids can ask me for more. Right. Amen? Amen? They're going to ask me stuff you would never dare to ask me. Thank you, by the way. But you, you know, it's the relationship and you need to understand you have that relationship with God. You can come right to God. You can talk right to God. You don't have to beat around the bush with God. You can say, Father, this is what I need. And guess what? God's not gonna be like, well, you need to go through the protocol, take 10 steps this way, jump through this hoop this way, and then come back and talk about me on Tuesday. God, don't do that. You can have access to God because Jesus made a way. This teaching that we're going to look at, actually, Jesus taught multiple times. How do I know this? Well, because in one of the other gospels, particularly the gospel of Luke, which I said was the gospel of Jesus' prayer life, actually, when he gets into this teaching on the model of prayer, do you know how it starts? It starts this way. The disciples say, Jesus, John's disciples teach him how to pray. Why don't you teach us how to pray? We notice that you do miracles. We notice that you have favor. We notice that God works when that stuff happens when you pray. Could you teach us? The disciples never asked, teach me to preach. They never asked, teach me to do miracles. They never asked, teach me this, teach me that. What we do see clearly, the one question, the big ask, is Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And so what did Jesus do? He offered them this model. So the best thing that we can do today, if we want to live in the practical righteousness of God and we want to experience the power of God, the effectiveness of God in prayer, is come to the Lord and say, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. And I promise you, if you'll pray that prayer, God will begin to teach you. Matter of fact, my whole prayer life started with being frustrated that everybody else sounded cool in their prayers and I sounded like a dummy. So I, I read in that verse where they said, Lord, teach me to pray. And I said, Lord, if everybody else can pray good, can you teach me how to pray? And I'm telling you, I went through like a six week 
or no, six month crash course where every book I saw was a book on prayer. Every scripture I read somehow had something to do with prayer. Every time I was talking to somebody, somebody would tell me something about prayer and God taught me how to pray. Of course, I also practiced. I went from praying my gut out. You know, I mean, seriously, you have to learn how to develop a prayer life like a muscle. I was all gung-ho for prayer. I was excited that God was gonna teach me to pray. So what did I do? I got on my knees in my ba- bedroom and, uh, and, and, and I started praying as hard as I could. And I was like, I'm gonna pray for an hour. And I'm praying, my, I'm praying my heart out. Like I'm going, I'm sweating, I'm praying so hard. I look at my clock when I'm done because I figure I got everything out. I look at my watch and I pray for like 45 seconds. <laughs> I thought for sure I had prayed for so much longer. And then I just kind of sat there on my knees for the rest of the hour. I was like, Lord, I told you I'd give you an hour, but I don't know what else. I'm happy to say now I can pray for an hour without stopping. But at that beginning point, everything I had was less than a minute. So I said, Lord, teach me to pray. Now remember, as we get into this, in uh, act two of Jesus' sermon on the Mount here, there's a pattern that he offers to us that, that is important for all of these issues. So we talked about charitable giving last time. We're gonna talk about prayer this time, fasting, and then provision. And all of them are gonna follow this pattern. What is it? We need to look at our motives, right? What is the inner motive that, that is driving our practice of righteousness. The second thing we needed to do was to look to God. It's not looking for men's approval. It's not looking for men to give us accolades or to recognize us. It is doing it for God, for an audience of one. The reason why I'm praying like I pray or the reason why I'm giving like I give or I'm fasting or I'm doing any of these things is because God is worthy. And then number three, we look for the reward of our righteousness as opposed to the world. I'm not interested in in, uh, building a platform for me or building a big name for me. I just want to be known in heaven. Y'all remember those demons, the seven sons of Sceva? In the book of Acts, these, these seven sons of the priest named Sceva, they had a deliverance ministry and they went around casting out demons. And this was a, a, a very normal thing in Jewish culture. And so they would go around and somebody had demonic stuff. They would go in, they would pray, they would do kind of some incantation, they would do some stuff and they would try to deliver a person from a demon. And so they come into this guy's house. This guy is clearly demonized. All seven of the boys, they're probably young, strong men coming up. We command you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches to come out of that man. And you know what that man said? Except for it wasn't the man, it was the demon. Said, well, Paul I know, or Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then he beat all of those men. They ran out of the house naked. I said it right, didn't I? My wife makes fun of how I say naked, so. (laughs) Naked, no clothes, amen? Why? because they weren't doing it from the right place. They didn't have the authority. They called on the name of Jesus, but to them it was just words. And what happened? They got the reward and it wasn't so good. They were made insta-famous, but in the wrong way, right? What we want is we want to receive the heavenly reward. We want to receive God's favor, God's blessing, God's answer. We don't care what the world says. We love them and want them to know Jesus. And the whole focus of our lives is to draw people, point people to Jesus because we're proud of him, because we love him and because he loves us, amen? Amen. So if you're taking notes, we're gonna look at Jesus' teaching here on prayer. And point number one is don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't pray like a hypocrite. I like to give you application points. So when you pray, don't pray like a hypocrite. Look at this, verse five and six. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So this first part really is about our motives, isn't it? Jesus is saying, don't pray like a hypocrite. Do you know what a hypocrite was? Uh, that Greek word is, is a word that was used for a play actor, for a stage actor. And back in, in Jesus's day, especially in the Greek culture, they would have, uh, uh, usually one man would be the whole play. 
And so that man would put a mask on and change his voice based on whatever character he was playing. And he would do it, obviously, they, they would do it for arts and entertainment, but really for recognition, for applause. In other words, a hypocrite was a stage actor playing a role. So playing a hypocrite meant putting on a performance. It meant there was recognition. If you were to pray like a hypocrite, you were praying for how, how holy you seemed or how well you prayed, that you didn't stumble over your words, that you had the right pause and the right intonation, that you had the right cadence, that you had it down. And that's what they did. See, there were two main places where public prayer took place in Jesus's day, in the church and on the street corners. And Jesus wasn't knocking where they were praying, but he was knocking how their heart was. See, what they wanted was they wanted, they wanted people to look at them and say, that's a holy man of God right there. That's a mighty woman of faith right there. Because boy, when they pray, just, whoo, they pray with such eloquence. They pray for so long. Here, I'm struggling for 30 seconds and they got this down, right? They're the kind of people you invite for dinner and they pray for an hour and your food gets cold. You're just like, I just prayed the Lord for the food, you know? They, they were putting on a performance. They were putting on the show. And when we pray, we don't want to do that. We want to pray with sincerity. It doesn't matter, you know, listen, when we pray, when I pray, I don't worry if you're going to judge me because I ain't praying for you. I'm not praying to you. I'm praying to my heavenly father. Amen. I want to be heard by him. Now, the majority of our prayer life should be private, right? Spent in the presence of God. Jesus wasn't knocking public prayer, but he was saying the emphasis is what? Your heart has to be focused on God. Your prayer is a conversation with God. It is not a petition for your fellow man. Think about it. King David's Psalms are a great example of sincerity in prayer, aren't they? Right, I love King David. King David is legit. You wanna, you're having a bad day, just go find you some Psalms because you'll find some where David's like, God kicked our teeth in. And some days you feel that way, don't you? You're driving down traffic. God, mm, flat tire, come on. Give him a ticket, right? We pray these things and we get upset and we get frustrated. David's depressed and he's like, God, I hate my life. Like, why am I on the run? You supposedly anointed me king and I'm hiding in caves. Like, what's going on? Or some of the Psalms of Asa, oh God, the wicked are winning. Why are they winning? I want to win. I thought God's people supposed to be blessed. Like they pray simple, sincere, honest prayers, not fluff. So much of the hypocrite praying style prayer is fluff. It's accolades. It's nonsense. Pray simple. Prayer's not a performance. It's a privilege right? You don't have to beg and plead and conjole. And I mean, maybe you did like your dad or your mom to give you something that they wanted to give you. You, they love you. Now they might say, use your words, but they're going to give you what you want because they know what you want. Amen? Amen. How much more will our heavenly father? So let me, when we pray, let's pray as though it was just us and the Lord. And when we do that, we'll have our heavenly Lord. We'll, we'll be stepping towards that heavenly reward. Right? You don't have to play, pray a bunch of, be honest, be real. It's not like God doesn't know what you're feeling anyways, is it? Right? right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes, listen, let me just be honest with you. There's a lot of Christians who, who, who take a passive aggressive stance with God. They're mad at God. But then when they pray, they, they, they act like they're not mad. When they go to church, they act like they're not mad. They just stop coming. They just stop praying. They just stop showing. Can I tell you the truth that God is not threatened by your anger? If you mad, tell him. Right. Well, like that's gonna break God? I mean, if that's a God you serve, you need a different one. Amen? Amen. God can handle your nonsense. Yeah, man. Amen? Amen? God can handle your pain yeah. and he can heal you from it, amen? God can listen to you while you get angry and you get it all out. And then God will pat you on your little head and say, okay, let's go from here. He can outlast us. And how does he do it? In love. So don't hide from God. Listen, if you're mad, don't punish him. But I'm not going to church now. 
That doesn't hurt God. That hurts you. I'm going to punish God. I'm going to deconstruct my faith and I don't understand stuff. So eh, it's God's fault. I hate my life. Eh. So I'm just going to go live it how I want. Well, that's smart. If you didn't catch my sarcasm there, was, that ain't smart. Don't do that. God loves you. He's big enough. If you're dealing with stuff, tell him. He doesn't have to be pretty. Y'all remember Hannah, Samuel's mom, when she was crying because she didn't have no kids? She was crying so bad. The priest came up and said, lady, stop hitting the bottle so soon. He thought she was drunk. She was so, so pouring out her heart to God. I said, I said, you can pray as honestly as you can. Pray to God. He can handle it. Amen? Amen. All right, that leaves me to point number two. First point was don't pray like a hypocrite. Point number two is don't pray like a heathen. Don't pray like a heathen. Let's look at verse seven and eight. It says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. The second warning Jesus gives us was really about how we see God. See, the heathen often viewed prayer as a way to kind of barter with their gods. They would give, they would do sacrifices, they would do, do prayers, and they would often spend many time or many, you know, long hours just repeating the chants and saying the prayers. Why? Because ultimately what they were trying to do is they were trying to wear their God down. Because Jesus said, don't think that it's your many words that are going to get you hurt. So they were like, listen, if I can just come and I can wear them down, then eventually they'll be like, okay, he's finally worthy because he's put in enough times, put in enough words. You know, it's like, it's like word count on your paper, right? Anybody have to remember word count when you, you know, you're, you're writing a paper and you can say what you need to say in like a little bit, but then you have to make like hundreds of words extra. God don't need your word count. Get to the point. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, when moms, let me ask you a question. If, if your kid comes to you, mom, 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 does it go good for that kid? Is that like the opposite of what they want? Isn't it? Like if we repeat the same phrase over and 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 over to God, do you think that God might be like, you're annoying me? <laughs> Just stop. We know that God has personality and God has emotions. Where do you think we get ours from? You don't need to do all that. You got God's attention. How do I know? because he sold everything to redeem you. Amen. He gave everything to call you son and daughter. So you don't need all that extra. We have a relationship with God. It's, Jesus said what? You don't need to worry about this stuff. Why? Because God even knows what you need before you even ask of it. Amen. So don't, don't, your prayer is not meant to manipulate God. Amen? Amen? Yeah. You can't twist God's arm. As if we were able, of, able to do that. Y'all remember that Jesus told his disciples, hey, follow me. And then what did he do? He just stepped off. Did he look back? No. no. Do you think Jesus is bothered? He loves us, but do you think he's going to be manipulated when we throw a fit and stop following? No. If that doesn't work, it's not going to work in prayer. Right. Well, God, I'll do this if you do this. God doesn't need you to do that. God loves you. He just wants to bless you. But God's grace comes God's way. Right? Right? So when we look to God and pray in faith, he hears us. And repeating our request is not the problem because some people say, well, wait. Wait, I, I, I thought we're supposed to pray without ceasing. I thought we're supposed to pray and be persistent like the widow woman with the judge. Well, that's true. Jesus' problem is not with repeated prayer requests. It's with empty repetition. It's praying words, but not having faith in our heart. The way, the way this is kind of how I used to do it in, in our house is uh, every time for dinner, I would ask my kid, when I ask my kids to pray, um, I would say, pray a different prayer. Because y'all know, like we grew up saying the same prayer. You know, say things like, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. My, and that's, that's the prayer. Well, do, you can say that without even thinking, can't you? Right? So let's, let's, you know, 
If, if I talked to my wife and every conversation was the exact same thing, how cool do you think she would, she would be with that? You think she would like that? No. She wouldn't like that. And, and if every, in every conversation uh, I said, I said, Nanette, I love you. Nanette, I want to do this. Nanette, let's go to do this. And I said her name every single second, every sentence. Do you think she would be like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Probably, right? I mean, if I used your name every other sentence, you'd be like, that dude, there's something. Have you ever noticed when we pray, sometimes it's Heavenly Father, our Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Lord, 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 Lord. He knows who he is. But we've been trained that that's what we do. And what I'm saying and what Jesus is saying, you don't need all that. I'm not saying we don't honor God and we don't say Heavenly Father. I'll throw her name in from time to time. But she, I don't, she knows I know who she is. It's not all these extra things. And yes, we repeat our prayers. Listen, how many times did Jesus pray in the garden? And what did he pray? The same prayer. How many times did Paul pray for the, the, the messenger of Satan to go away, the thorn in his flesh to go away? The same prayer. So is Jesus being mad at anyone praying the same prayer? No. What is he saying? Don't pray empty prayers. If you got a prayer request, bring it until you get an answer from heaven. Amen. Now, let's, listen, we've said this before, but if the answer is no, then leave it. Amen? Amen. Someone was trying to manipulate, but God, but God, but God, and God. And you never want to hear God say, fine, have it your way. No. Ask Balaam about that or read Romans chapter one about that. You'll see, not good. So if you're interested in the will of God and God says no, stop right there. When we pray, we don't want to simply pay lip service. We don't need long paragraphs. We really just need to come with the simple faith of a child. I love what Jesus said. He said, little children, it's, got, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If I come with the faith of a child, what does God want to give me? The kingdom. Because I'm one of his children. He doesn't do this because we wear him down. He doesn't answer our prayer because we're begging him or pleading. He does it because he loves us and he hears us. Right, in, in one of my favorite standoffs in the entire Bible is in 1 Kings chapter 18. It's the prophet Elijah versus the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Ashur. And the prophet Elijah starts off 1 Kings 18. His introduction is a prophetic word where he says, he says, uh, uh, thus says the Lord before whom I stand, there will neither be rain on the, on, on the land until I say so. Now the key was what? Before whom I stand, who? The Lord. He's a nobody. No one hears, no one knows Elijah the Tishbite. No one even knows who he is. He just comes out and says, I'm coming from the presence of God. I stand in his presence. I live in his presence. And I'm telling you, God has given me the authority to say no rain until I feel like it should come. And then he's up on this mountain and he, he, he grabs the king because all the people have turned away from God. And he grabs the king. He says, hey, I'll tell you what, you get the prophets of Baal out here and I'll call on God. And whichever God answers from heaven with fire, that's the real God. You repent and you follow him. Amen. And he's like, oh, that's a good deal. So Elijah, you know the deal that goes up and, and he, says, he gives the prophets of Baal a shot. Y'all go first. They cut themselves. They go through their routines. They're they're singing their chants. They're doing their things. And, and it's, it's getting later. And uh, Elijah is, is, man, he's funny. Because y'all know what he, he calls him out. He starts punking him. He's like, hey. He's like, hey, maybe your God's in the bathroom. That's what he says. He's like, maybe he's, he's in the bathroom. Call louder. Maybe he's taking a nap. You need to wake him up. And they go for more hours, cutting themselves even more, shouting their, their chants even more. Nothing. And Elijah says, all right, my turn. And in like two sentences, he says, God, this is your idea. Let everybody know that you're God. And what happens? <sighs> Fire from heaven. Was it his many words or was it his relationship? His relationship. So don't pray like the heathen. You don't need all those words. Don't pray like someone that has no relationship with God. They're trying. Instead, pray like a son or a daughter to their heavenly father who loves them and listens for their voice. Amen? Amen. And then point number three, pray like a citizen of heaven. 
Pray like a citizen of heaven. So we have hypocrites, right? We got heathen, and now we got heavenly people. So I'm gonna read the rest of this prayer very quickly because you know it. In this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if you want to pray effectively and receive the reward, which is an answer, then you want to follow this pattern that Jesus provides. This pattern is how a kingdom person prays. This model is what causes heavens to be opened up. So what is the pattern? I'm going to give you three little things. You ready? Praise, petition, and prologue. Praise, petition, and prologue. When we open, we open the prayer with praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're holy, you're worthy, you're in heaven, you're awesome, you're God, there's none like you. We worship you, we praise you. Let your will be done, let your kingdom come. What are we doing? We are, we are focusing on who God is, we're his position, his plan, his power, his will, his desire. We're saying, God, whatever you want is what I want. Before I get off in what I want, what I think I need and what I think should be happening in this world, I wanna orient myself with what do you want? What do you desire? When we make God and his will our starting point, what we do is we align ourselves. The rest of our petition lines up with his will and his desire. And and honestly, this helps us from being too self-centered, too selfish when we pray, because we don't see the big picture, do we? God does. So, So we open our prayers with praise. It's often why we open our services with praise, with worship. Why? Because we're orienting our focus on God. Second part of our prayer is the petition. And this is where we ask for things like provision and protection. We ask God that he meets our physical needs, right? Lord, give us this daily bread. We're asking God to meet our spiritual needs. What are we saying? Lord, forgive. I need forgiveness today because I know I said something dumb. I know I did something stupid. I had a wrong attitude, a wrong mindset, or maybe I just did something without even realizing that God, please forgive me. We ask God to protect us from temptation and from the plans, the the strategies, the schemes of the evil one. That's when we make our petitions. And it's worth noting that Jesus puts a big emphasis on forgiveness, isn't it? And, And if we refuse to forgive others, then what does God say? He ain't gonna forgive us. So what what does that mean? That means we can actually limit the effectiveness of our prayers and we won't receive the reward that we're after. We've already seen in in earlier portions of, of the Sermon on the Mount that love, like blessing our enemies, forgiving those, blessing those who curse you, turning the other cheek, that love really is the pinnacle of righteousness. And without righteousness, what happens? We can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we might even apply this figuratively to our prayers. If we don't pray in righteousness, pray in love, then our prayers don't ascend to heaven. We might go that far and say that. Jesus is definitely saying that when you don't forgive, your prayers are hindered. And then the final part of the pattern of prayer is is the prologue. It's the ending. It's the closing. And what do we do? Give give thanks. We give praise. We give God glory. We thank him for responding. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are awesome. And I love you. And I thank you for hearing me. And I thank you for all the good things you've done that you rule, you reign, and it's all going to work out. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Now, can we pray the literal prayer of Jesus here and God hear us? Absolutely. And we should. I probably pray this every day. But is this prayer meant to be the only prayer that we pray? Or is it supposed to be kind of a model or a pattern that we follow? It's a model because Jesus said in this manner or after this pattern, therefore pray. So when you pray, however you pray, praise God before you make your petition and give him thanks and honor him in your prologue because this is the way Jesus taught us to pray. Set your mind on heavenly things where Christ is Bring your requests, your needs before the throne of grace. And then remember 
that God has got you because he's your heavenly father and he loves you. Amen? Amen. Prayer is a privilege given to the children of God. It's something that leads to a great reward. And as we discover that prayer brings us into the presence of God, we find out that it's more than that. It's an invitation to partner with him to see his will done in the world. And when we pray, God answers us, God hears us. Look at John 5, 14 through 15. One of my favorite, favorite passages on prayer in the Bible. It says this, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. When you pray the right way, God hears you. And if he hears you, he answers you. So when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites or the heathen, right? Be sincere, be simple. Instead, pray like a citizen of heaven in the righteousness of Christ, of Christ by faith, just trusting that remember it's the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man that avails much. Do it the right way. Stand in the righteousness of Christ and prayer works. Following Jesus' example and teaching on prayer will empower us to have effective prayer lives of our own. We'll see God's answers to our petitions in the form of provision, protection, and divine purpose. And through our prayers, we'll partner with God to bring his kingdom into our lives and into the world. So as we wrap this up, I want you to just think for a second. Think of the potential. Think of what your prayer can bring to bring change into your life, to bring blessing into your family, to bring God's kingdom and his will and his purpose into our world. Think of how underutilized prayer as a means of grace is for us bringing the change that we want to see in this world to pass. To go from hope to ideal to something concrete and something real. What we need is God. What we need is his resources and his provision and his power. And the way that you and I get to see that come is through prayer. I don't know what you need, but I know that God uses that prayer is the way that you make your request. I don't know, I don't know what you know, you're looking for, what wisdom you, you're looking for, what relational situation you want to fix, what job opportunities before you, what, what financial need you have, what physical need you have. But I do know this, that when you pray in the way that Jesus offered you to pray, you'll get an answer. And that answer will be God's perfect and acceptable and glorious will. And so whatever answer he gives you, it will be good. And it will be for you good because God works all things together for our good. Amen? So today I wanna to encourage you, pray. Pray in the way of Jesus. You don't have to do all the fluff. You don't have to do all the nonsense. Be honest, be real, and pray. And you'll find that God actually loves to hear your voice. There's nothing more transformative than, than, than that experience of prayer. So let's pray, amen? I'm gonna ask you to bow your head with me, and while you're doing that, I invite you to ask God, what is he saying to you in this message? Father, I ask that you would make us a people of prayer. Lord, that you would demystify it, that you would take away all the, the stuff that we throw on top of prayer and help us just get to the simple heart of prayer. A child talking to their father. Lord, I pray that you would free us from religion, free us from lies and falsehood, free us from fear and help us through your love and grace, come boldly to the throne of grace for help in time of need. Father, I thank you that you listen to our voices and it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.